Hello, welcome to the Meeting Tent, an ongoing series on the work of Stan Tennant. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our usual cast of characters, Lavana Tennant, Michael Andron, and Daniel Gill. And once again, Adele Packer couldn't join us today, so we'll just plow on. So we're going to continue. Uh, this is part two of what we started last time. Um, we're going through Stan's posters now, the graphic representations of his ideas and uh, what was going on. This one that we chose um, is... Dense. <laughs> yeah, this one is pretty complex. And again, it's like seeing an outline of something in depth, um, Stan's thinking, being shared, but in kind of a capsulated view. Um, Gone Eden and Geometric Metaphor. I titled the, the uh, program, The Garden of Eden, uh, the uh, geometry in linear and cyclic time. Uh, so what we're really talking about here is what's uh, referred to as geometric metaphor. Um, and I think as we go through this, we, we want to try to keep that term in mind, uh, geometric metaphor, and what that meant to Stan and his his uh, theories and his work. I think so much of it is based on this idea, and it's not being really presented in any other form that I've seen or anybody else who's really talking about this. Uh, so we went through the poster last time. Uh, as you can see, it's divided into sections, and we do have notes. Again, if you would like a copy of this poster and the notes, um, I'll put the information on the screen now, and uh, go ahead and email me, and I'll uh, send you a PDF, um, and you can kind of follow along. So we went through A, B, and C. We're now on D, um, and he calls this the garden. Um, does somebody want to read the notes or uh, if not, I can do it. I can okay. read it. Okay, so the, the notes for D. Okay. And I'll put the verbiage on the screen also. All right. This illustrates that the garden, gun, has a numerical value of 53. The apex angle of the inverted T, as above, so below, golden rule triangle is 53, 53 degrees. The two sides of the inverted T triangle can be identified with the two legs of the Masonic compass, which, is, which also form a 53 degree angle. This also identifies the triangle over the pyramid on the back of the US $1 bill and the triangular paving stones known as Herod's Triangle found on the floor of Herod's second temple. And okay, you don't have to read the reference, that's, that's okay. Um, wow. Okay, so- That's, that's uh, actually an important thing and unfortunately it's missing from this particular poster. So um, Bill, you can put that in. Um, yeah, these were actual paving stones uh, yeah. from the location of Herod's temple which uh, this particular this particular pattern of paving stones is not found anywhere else, and they include a triangle which is basically the same as above, so below triangle. Um, and just for people who are interested, there is um, reference work that's you know published scientific reference work on this particular triangle. Unfortunately, the article is only in Hebrew, but it does exist. <laughs> okay. So I want to play, because um, this idea of the 53 degrees came up in another uh, segment that Stan did. Um, I want to play uh, a portion of a video. Um, this is on our site, meruvideo.com. And this is a series we did video companions to the uh, the book, The Alphabet That Changed the World. And this was episode one, A Prayer for Peace. Now, just to let you know, these were done like around, I think, 2018, 2019. 
Stan was in an advanced stage of Parkinson's. Um, so we couldn't videotape him, but as you'll see, his mind was still pretty sharp and we did audio tape. And then I uh, just uh, included graphics over his voice. All right, I'm gonna start the video and uh, prepare to be somewhat blown away. So let me go ahead and start this. And I'm reading this and I get to this, I can, we can go get the text. I'll summarize it. This was written about 1800, roughly. Um, astronomy knew the size of the Earth, knew the size of the Sun. This rabbi was educated. Uh, he was writing for educated people. And he says at one point, for example, the Sun whose body is finite and limited quantitatively, being approximately 167 times the size of the globe of the Earth. What? 167 times, the, the sun is 167 times the globe of the Earth? It's not true. And there's a bottom, there's footnotes on the page in, in the Tanya, which attempts to make, to rationalize this. They don't do a good job of it. Um, we could read the, the quote. It, it is not plausible. So I'm looking at this number 167. What, what, what's 167 correspond to? Well, they, they're talking about globe of the Earth. They didn't just say Earth, they said globe. Well, that implies a sphere, a circle. Uh, and I knew from past experience that sometimes if I multiplied or divided by pi, I got a meaningful result. So I took 167 and divided by pi. And that gives me 53.1, give or take. The apex angle of the, in the drawing of the triangle is 53 degrees. And that's really suspicious because that drawing, this inverted T geometry, makes sense of what the rabbi says. So here's a statement from the Tanya. What is, what is the Tanya, by the way? Anybody know? Yeah, it's written by the Alter Rebbe of Chabad. Okay, well, our audience doesn't know that. Ah, it's written by the Alter Rebbe from Chabad. Okay. The, found, the founder of Chabad Hasidut of uh, that particular branch of Hasidism um, wrote a masterwork. It's like the code book um, on, um, on Chabad Hasidut, which tends to be leaning toward a more intellectual um, view of the mystical world, as opposed to a more experiential dance and sing and um and reach it through that kind of joyfulness not that they don't um but tends to be a little bit more in the head chabad stands for chachma bina da'at which are the um wisdom understanding and insight which or translated different ways which are all intellectual sfirot they are properties of energies that are mind energies as opposed to heart energies. Well, that kind of fits into it. You know, then here's a rabbi who's making this statement. Um, it's, just, I mean, why would he make this statement? Yeah, Dan. Yeah, well, this is fascinating. I just learned this re very recently. Um, if you look in the notes on the very, in, in the Tanya, in, in what's called Likute Amarayim, which is the collection of, literally means a collection of sayings or aphorisms, like like the point of, of the Tanya is that he's actually representing material from previous generations of Kabbalists in a way that his generation would have understood and coming generations could study. Mm. And if you look, one of the first books he quotes is Shefatol. So like there's a direct, I didn't know that there's a, I mean, I knew that he, where he was getting it from because the quotes are similar, but he right out front, this is, this is from Shep Atal, and he he quotes it openly. One of his main uh, premises is actually from the Shep Atal, so he was quite familiar with it. And I think there were th there were like I can't remember three or four books that he he said he couldn't live without. One, I think one of which was the Shep Atal. It was like Shari Ora, Shep Atal, Pardes Rimonim, and Eitz Chaim, something like that. Like it was just these were his, these were his like like go to for for understanding the depths of Torah, and so a lot of that is. A lot of Tanya is really familiar. So, so now it makes sense when you have, you know, Shef Atal, you know, 
uh, and you have, and there's this, there's this deep connection and Stan, who also had this incredibly deep connection to the chef at all. Um, I mean, unbeknownst to him when he started, uh, it, it's fascinating, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to get into that in the next, uh, in the next portion of the poster, um, where he, he shows us, uh, an example of chef at all. But I mean, I'm just getting back to this. I mean, I'm just, when he, I didn't even see it when when we recorded it. And then when I went back and edited this video, I mean, this to me is kind of mind blowing that this rabbi would come up with this statement that made no sense until, you know, you applied pi and came up with the angle of the triangle. You know, his assumption has always was always that these people were smart, wise, and particularly in the case of people like the Alta Rebbe, educated. I mean, this was not anyone who would have been considered ignorant at the time. I mean, he knew he 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 knew the math. Okay, um, and so. The assumption was also that words were chosen very carefully, particularly by someone who was immersed in this body of learning that says the meanings of the letters themselves and the qualities that they portray are very important. And being, you know, the again, assuming that therefore the words were chosen very carefully for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and so the idea was, okay, somehow for the Alter Rebbe, this statement made sense. He had a certain, you know, he was educated according to the times. And therefore, what is a way in which this statement actually can make sense and fit in with the rest of the body of work that we know about? Um, Stanley had already been, you know, narrowing in on uh, exploring the idea of numerical meaning um, in relationships in the letters in terms of uh, either uh, well-known natural constants like pi or uh, ratios that referred to them. There's, we have a whole section of information about that. Um, and so he started exploring the the words that were used. Um, and lo and behold, came up, you know, realized that this particular triangle, you know, that the relationships and angles in this particular triangle um, were uh, a part of the structure of the words that were used. I don't want to. I don't want to use words like either buried or encoded or all the kinds of things that people might normally use because it's not respectful to the deep and complex body of knowledge that's being indicated here by the Alter Rebbe's writing. Um, so that's kind of where Stanley was coming from. And that's turned out to be extremely fruitful in a whole kind, all kinds of directions. Um, mm. uh, in terms of, of unpacking what was being written here. Yeah. I mean, I'm just imagining him reading this statement, and like he said, he's looking at it and says, "What? You know, well, that can't be right." And then he he applies pi, and there it is. You know, well, it uh, took a lot longer than that. <laughs> of course, of course, it did. It's still, you know, and and that that holds true to everything we're doing here. You know, we're we're, you know, we're synthesizing in this few minutes what Stan took years to develop. Um, so um, that's part of the, uh, and that enhanced his um, work on the inverted T triangle. It just reinforced something that he was trying to disprove. And every time he tried to disprove something, it had the opposite effect. 
And and as I said before, there's a whole wall of posters in Lavana's home that has that embedded in uh, uh, topics that are not necessarily related. Um, okay, so let's go down to um, D. And um, again, Lavon, if you want to go ahead and. Well, actually, D is what we just read. Um, oh, so we're at E. Yeah, we're we're at E. Yeah. So let me uh, let me zoom in on that, and I'll put it up on. And and there's a little personal note that you'll appreciate here. So go ahead and and uh, and read that. Okay. The drawing illustrates the flow of information, negentropy, and loving kindness through the garden, extending a seed to a tree to a fruit, and extending the light of the sun to the plane of the earth. The letter chart below shows the relationship of the English words for grow, gradient, garden, grid, and grade. The letter Dalit, whose pictogram is a triangle, is identified with the Greek letter delta, and the delta extending and and the and the delta extending a river into the sea below in the left hand corner is a photo from the back of our apartment showing galenas creek flowing from the highlands of marin county into the upper san francisco bay richardson bay so that's the view out of my rear window where there, is, where there is construction going on right now. So I'm going to mute myself. Um, so there's there's your your chef at all. Um, let me, uh, oh, we're seeing it over here. But look at the other side, negentropy. Um, here's a term that doesn't come up too often in our everyday conversations. So let's take a look at this. It's uh, negentropy is reverse entropy. It means things becoming more in order. By order is meant organization, structure and function, the opposite of randomness or chaos. One example of negentropy is a star system, such as the solar system. Another example is life. So um, uh, I guess Stan is using negentropy as a representative of a system of normality, I guess. Um, Just you... very briefly before, yeah. uh, he's using negentropy as uh, a um, non-religious way of saying the energy that keeps life going in the universe, the uh, the the existence of organization as opposed to declining towards chaos, which is, you know, the uh, assuming, assuming that the universe is eventually going to end in a whimper as opposed to a bang. Um, what other metaphors can I use? I, I had a problem with him with regards to using the word neg entropy. It took him a while to understand that people who are not scientifically trained tend to, you know, hear the neg and they say, oh, something's declining. And they don't mm -hmm. because the word entropy is not a part of their vocabulary that they normally think of. Nonetheless, the book uses the term neg entropy. <laughs> and what he means in um, spiritual terms is... Um, can be equated to the flow of loving kindness that keeps our universe and our existence going. Um, that's what he is referring to when he uses the term neg entropy in this context. Right. Um, and so I think, uh, let, let me put it back up on here. Um, so we can then move to F, which is the Shefa part of that. Um, neg entropy being outside, Shefa Tal being inside. Um, and um, I'll read this. This expands on the idea of the gradient, the Shefa Tal, the flow of neg entropy 
follows the gradient from the singularity of Hashem to all the all-inclusiveness of Elohim, subtending all of creation. Shefa can also mean incline. Sefer Yetzirah uses the word emek, meaning valley or depth or gradient. And here, uh, what is this? Um, what is he? What is this line in Hebrew that he's quoting from? Does anybody know? Those look it's like a, definitions. Yeah, it's like a ramp. Kagon Masila Barzello or Kavish. I think that's. Uh... I think that's saying maybe like a shipua is like the 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 gradient of a, of a ramp it has a certain angle it comes down at. Um, I think that's right. Um, the, yeah, these are, um, these are quotes taken from. I guess he took them from the Alkale, from a from a Hebrew English dictionary, mm -hmm. or from the Hebrew Hebrew dictionary actually. Um, yeah. Oh, I see. This was from a English to Hebrew Hebrew to English dictionary. And in fact, you can see, even just looking at the outlines on the right-hand side of that, that um, with, for the different, for the definition of, the, for the Hebrew equivalent to the word of gradient or to flow, um, the Hebrew has a phrase in addition to a word. That That's all that that is. It's, it's, a, it's an expansion um, in Hebrew of, how one would refer to a gradient in Hebrew to get the same, to get an equivalent meaning. Right, and any gradient's gonna have a, uh, it's gonna have an associated angle, whatever mm -hmm. it is. I mean, it's just, like, you can't have one without the other. Right. So it's kind of the word Shepa itself is implied. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it implies an angle, yeah. Yeah, and the three, uh, the as you can see, um, the the Hebrew where he's got the that he has outlined underneath the letter F, those three letters or however they all spell sh uh, the word Shefa. Um, and Bill, if you could just sort of point out the the uh, the Samak, the Pei, and the and the I, and just so the people can be sure that those are the three same letters. Yeah, Hebrew is, is a language of roots. So the first one is a noun. Uh, the next two are verbs. And if you look at the translation, you can see the, the it's in the form of an infinitive, to incline, to emanate. Those are verbs, either intransitive or transitive verbs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and dealing with the same three-letter root, the... Uh, yeah, yeah, the Shin Pei Ayin. Is he making Pei some Pei statement about those letters or their numbers or anything or is he simply showing the derivation of the word shefa in this particular place he is simply showing the derivation of the word shefa and okay. how it can imply both gradient and flowing you know, and emanation um so yeah the, the there's nothing numerical here but geometrically so, it's implying that it's not just a flowing river downward but it's a flowing river, like it would flow down a slant, mm -hmm. which would then match up with his angle mm -hmm. of the 53 degrees. And, and the, also the idea of emanation, which in, at least in my, you know, when I image things, that seems to involve like energy coming out of God knows where, you know, it's just emanates. Yeah. And that is another quality that he is trying to imply um, for this, what he refers in his work as Shefa Tal, the, the, the flow of negentropy, as it's put it, as he refers to it in his book. Yeah, that's a steep, it's a steep angle too. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a very steep angle, very quick angle. I mean, it's, it, this is all re super related to the, what people call the tree of life the the spherotic tree uh and how those those pipes so to speak how they flow you know this really i mean this is quite i mean it's just again it's like it's classic what's interesting about it is again that he he very brilliantly relates it to uh to angle mm -hmm. and to geometry is is super super important 
uh, because it's it's inclusive of uh, the physical world, which is classically a, a Jewish idea. Um, you know, we've got the you've got the shefa coming down, but then you also have the elevation of what's down to up. It's not it's not like either is better than the other. Actually, either or is kind of missing the other. You know, if someone is totally spiritual, it's very nice, but it's hard, very hard to relate to. You know. Or, or if someone's totally physical, uh, you know, uh, it's also very hard to, it's very hard to want to relate to, you know, like, there's just, it's like boring, you know, it's like, okay, uh, uh, there's not much going on internally. And so I think it's very beautiful what he has here that it's, he's not, he's not negating the, the physical, rather, he's, he's explaining how the physical and spiritual work actually really are supposed to work together. Um, yeah, it's back to inside and outside. If you go back to this uh, information, mm -hmm. this triangle up here, I mean, mm -hmm. you go back to the beginning of our discussions back in episodes one or two, and we talked about the bait representing inside and outside. Mm -hmm. uh, and this here's another representation of that, that mm -hmm. all systems require this, uh, this complementary yet opposing uh, principle. So inside, I mean, yeah, what, what you just said, ne negentropy is outside, something we can see and imagine, sunlight and earth. Um, and inside is the process, see, tree, and fruit. And we get back to, and, and, and then that's part of the, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge again. Um, and we're going to look at that a little bit more when we get to, uh, well, we're going to get into G. Um, right there um and here we have uh linear now we're getting into the aspects of time uh as represented in geometric metaphor um let's see um so this section in the middle of the page summarizes the qualities of the two trees the linear progressive evolutionary time of the tree of life versus cyclicity of the tree of knowledge of good and evil the cyclic earth plane is identified with the wheel karma in some traditions and with the potter's kick wheel in Zohar. It models the idea of action and reaction, tit for tat, and what goes around comes around. Um, and we talked about um, the wheel of karma in a previous episode um, versus um, the um, uh, wheel of karma. And so, and then, the, and then, well, the, the Plato quote is below that. But um, so now we're looking at in terms of time, uh, linear time being the tree of life and cyclic time being the tree of knowledge. Uh, cyclic time being more of like the earth plane three-dimensional time ruled by the clock and the calendar where linear time is never changing. It's always, it's always the same. Um, anybody have any thoughts on, on this aspect of, of time and, and how he's presenting it? Well, I mean, it, you know, I mean, the, the linear time seems to be going, it's obviously going from above to, to below. It's coming down. So it could be that there's a there's a it just occurred to me right now that there could be like a concept of like essential time that's not time bound. I don't I'm not sure what that is, but there's something essential about time that is is not time bound. There's there's something internal to time. Yes. And as that as that comes down, it becomes more it's it's linear from above, which is undefinable to a definable definable progression of 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 evolution maybe of the mind or of consciousness as opposed to of something that's just like you know and now it's uh whatever it's whatever time it is here and it's you know it's three three ten here and it's whatever and it's going to be four in an hour and as opposed to that it's like this yeah i don't know well yeah um, if, it, if you if you take uh the, this it's helpful if you reference some earlier um earlier diagrams of this same as above so below triangle where he's got different labels on it um equating it with uh if you go back to the shema the you know 
hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. You know, that, that's the most common English translation. But the idea that um, that five letter name Elohim is, uh, which is traditionally associated with nature, therefore associated, you can imagine with time experienced cyclicity, uh, cyclically, you know, the cycle of the years, the cycle of, of how the, the, uh, the stars, prog the progression of, of how we view the stars, I'm blanking on the word, but whatever. And then the, uh, the Hashem, the four letter name being originating from out of time, Right. Utterly, in, you know, utterly infinite. Right, 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 um, right. Yeah. The, basically, huh. the possibility for the injection of novelty into this unchanging cycle. Right. Um, that's, I think, you know, that's what you were getting at. That, yeah, that's exactly right. right. Now I'm remembering. So, right. So, so God, right. It's the, um, the Fourier transform. I remember yes. talking about yes. that with Stan. Exactly. And that the, exactly. the, it's the pulse has no extension over time but it activates like everything within the spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. But, yeah. and that's the, the Hashem, the line, the straight, it's not, it's beyond time. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So that, so that does really make sense and compared to what he's talking about, which would mean that there's the, I mean, just to get, to get even deeper, you know, there's the progression of the soul as it reincarnates, mm -hmm. which is kind of beyond time in a sense. It's beyond time space. However, it takes place within time space yeah I and mean, you could say the physical and the spiritual there are a lot of ways to learn it but yeah so the key the key term in terms of understanding um what he's talking about in um cyclic uh i'm sorry linear time is that word in the middle there now so linear time is always in the now it's always present um i did this um mm. I did a video called The Seeker's Guide to the Fourth Dimension, using fourth dimension as a metaphor, not as a technical term. Um, and the way I defined it there was that three-dimensional time is linear. Uh, it's always moving, it's finite, ruled by the calendar and the clock, and that basically we exist in time, where uh, the use of the four-dimensional time is static, it's um, always in the present. It um, is infinite. And time exists, in, in this case, time exists in us, within us. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's a distinction in, in terms of looking at two different elements of time. We only think of time as physical time. Well, you know, beginning and end, we born, we die. Uh, <clears throat> but People who are spiritually oriented uh, or consciousness oriented understand that there is another uh, time that is, is infinite and that it, we're always in it and it lasts, you know, forever. And that's our connection to uh, oneness. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Now, Stan was more technical in his way of expressing things, and um, uh, but it, it's the same theory. And I think it's important uh that i think it's a perspective that's very important for people to understand and stan was right on it well it, it, in the shefatal again this is like i mean this is like a diagram of how the shefatal describes life i mean in terms of the soul and then the body and the relationship between the two and how that relates to the godliness of of the soul and and how that maps out over time and it, it i mean this is like <laughs> You know, and, the, and and I mean, of course, the the driver of all of it is the soul or or God or this spiritual aspect. And I mean, it just this just maps out. I mean, almost exactly. And according to the Tanya, also quotes that part of again, he quotes that part of Shefet. I mean, it's just this is just a, a way of looking at it that 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 adds a, a, a just a literally a dimension by which like this almost could be used for like this sounds so weird maybe but like spiritual technology or like a technology yeah. that's based on consciousness as opposed to like one plus one equals two like yeah. there are deeper you know this this definitely hints at some sort of i think some, some sort of very high level of real high technology not just uh more and more tiny transistors you know 
I totally agree. And I, I, I also believe if you start with this concept of inside and out and you expand it, you know, and that's what Stan's doing here. He's taking this idea and he's expanding it uh, in various different examples. But in terms of using it for time, you know, I think that this is a universal lesson that I think if people understood uh, would help a lot of people on a spiritual path um, in terms of understanding the reality of the way things are. Um, and as I think I mentioned in the, the previous um, the, the previous video recording session, there has been work done which shows that when we as humans use our imagination to project ourselves in future time, different brain regions are used depending on whether you are projecting yourself linearly like, um, you know, what's going to happen in 10 years when I'm however old I'm going to be in 10 years, um, which is in a sense linear, or when you're saying, oh, spring is going to come around again what do I do in spring, which is in mm. a sense cyclical. And that there actually are those pieces of imagination a projection that you do as part of your imagination actually use two different brain regions. Wow. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, again, we came across that paper maybe three or four years after we were intensely discussing this. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that happened a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the way we're going. And I think that uh, the direction that uh, the more people uh, understand these concepts, um, the more we'll get towards Stan's ultimate goal of, you know, of peace, of understanding, of knowing that we're not just walking egos, um that we all have this other element that is universal it's all in the same place it's all in the same plane of existence um so to illustrate it he um uses plato and here's his notes on that below the drawing of, is a reference from proclus discussion of plato's timaeus um proclus was one of the last of the Plat platonists if that's pronounced correctly in his On the Timaeus, he attributes to Plato the same two qualities we have been discussing represented here by the same two lines. Plato's Timaeus 360 BCE is more recent than the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, which is 458 and 445 BCE. And this suggests that Plato and perhaps Pythagoras before him gleaned their understanding from concepts associated with the Garden of Eden in Torah tradition. So here's the quote, things have a twofold nature, the one invisible, unique, simply, simple and unworldly, and the other visible, multiple, varied and distributed throughout the world. Hmm. There are two kinds of energy, the one primordial, immovable and intellectual, the other secondary, kinetic and revolving in relationship with the, in relation with the intellect. The one is free from cause and effect, the other it contains them. Well, there are a lot of hints in terms of the ancient Greek philosophers understanding these concepts, and and especially when you put it in the, the realm of Pythagoras, in which geometry emerged, it makes it even more uh, relevant. Yeah, it's it's a definitely a pet peeve of mine, the, the Western kind of arrogant assumption that everything comes from the Greeks. Um, there's no proof, there's no proof for that. There's just an assumption. Because you can't, you know, you can't, you, you know, if you want to go dates, if you want to use dates as a proof, so then our the Jewish civilization or the civilization based on Torah in whatever form it was then, um, or where, however we had it at that point, uh, predates predates the Greeks by quite a bit, and uh, I I just I think again, you know, the assumption that because there are, there's a relationship with Kabbalah and 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 uh, Plato's philosophy uh, assumes that the Kabbalah got it from Plato. It's it's um, it's it's a lack of depth 
scholars who do that, no matter how much they know, are are lacking in depth, quite quite honestly, of the profundity and and and, and depth of the Kabbalistic tradition. They just simply have no idea uh, about how how the texts uh, match with each other, very even from vastly different perspectives over time. Or you know the the the, the great assumption that well, obviously Moshe de Leon is the one who wrote the Zohar, right? What, whereas the Shari Ora quotes the Zohar. And it's it's a couple hundred it's almost three hundred years late, uh, earlier, right? So so the Shari is quoting the Zohar before Moshe de Leon was ever even thought of. He was not even born yet, you know. And so there there again, it's a it's a cursory study of things and and a study that fits in uh, quite frankly with uh, academic funding. Um, if you come to an academic uh, group and say, "Hey, I'd like to I want to show you really some neat things," you know, actually it could could be that the Greeks actually got a lot of their stuff from the Jews. You're not going to get funded, and you're not going to be led into university, period. Uh, and so, again, this—I mean—it's touching on subjects that are are tangentially related, but but in terms of of understanding and spreading understanding, uh, there's a, a subtle and sometimes not so subtle anti-Semitism that exists uh, within the academic world. Um, and I think that this is something. And I, 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 Stan never talked about it, although he did have some. Conflicts with the academic world, but yeah, encounters, yes, yeah. Made, yeah, but but I, I you know, it, it's very possible he he always judged people as much as he could on the side of merit, but it's very possible that some of the reason he got pushed back was because there's a, again a very subtle anti-Semitism because sure. because because academia really comes from the Christian world and from the Christian church, but which also has thousands of years of you know anti-Semitism. And also, Daniel, also the fact that the rabbis didn't talk about this either. There's nothing really in in Jewish literature. There's there's the association with the Greeks. But nobody's ever, I've never seen any claim that the Greeks absorbed some rabbinic knowledge and was able to, have you? I mean, does anybody? There are there are sources, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely connections between the worlds. We know that the, rabb the rabbinic movement specifically was uh, deeply connected with Rome. Uh, they, they were they were advisors to kings and, and all sorts of things. And and there are there are some sources that go uh, even even deeper in terms of actually Greek sources talking about the wise men uh, in the East, uh, and and there's there's very serious work that that actually those were Jews uh, that that there was these were not you know in the modern context if you say wise men from the East everyone maybe a little bit in a racist way thinks of of people from you know uh, East uh, in Asia. You know, so oftentimes this is another problem in scholarship is people take modern assumptions and throw them back thousands of years. You know, so there, there, there is actually, uh, there is actually some real notion that that the Greeks actually got some of their some of their idea, or at least there were connections. And my point isn't that it's necessarily us. It's my point is that you, when you're going back in history, you can't assume you really you don't know. <laughs> you really you know you can't say well obviously the Kabbalists got it from well why obviously what do you have a time machine <laughs> you know you can go back and see what they you can't and so so when you have a scholarly trail for over a thousand years more even because you can find these ideas in Masakat Chagiga which goes back even more which then goes back even more from before the destruction of the temple um, when you've got a scholarly trail for two thousand years approximately. Uh, that's something you can't say, well, they obviously they got it from, it's like, again, it's just so superficial, like they got it from the Greeks, like, well, okay, I mean, like, you know, it's, anyway, sorry, I'm going on a tangent, but I think it's important yeah, in terms and, of Stan's words. And in words. terms of why, you know, for those 2,000 years, it wasn't generally talked about in the Christian world, um, all you have to do is look at history right. and, you know, realize that, um, I mean, you know, people wanted to live and therefore they were not going to say, um, excuse me, you're wrong to the people who were uh, yeah. <laughs> in control of their lives. Yeah, right. for sure. Well, yep. one of the, Stan did allude to this either in a, in a presentation or maybe a discussion uh, in terms of, you know, not saying for sure, but the possibility exists that the rabbis did a study with Pythagoras um, when geometry was being developed. His point being was that what happened after that is what the Greeks did in basically turning these ideas into gods, uh, physical yeah. gods uh, that they started to worship. Mm -hmm. And once that happened, then the rabbis pulled out.
they said well, no, it can't happen. He, he, he hmm. also, to be fair, um, always made the assumption that it, even in reading Greek sources, one has to assume that those people who were actually wise understood the difference between physical reality and non-physical reality. Um, I'll just put it that way. And that they, that, but that, um, you know, as usual, when knowledge, information, whatever, gets transmitted from generation to generation, very often what you wind up is with is lowest common denominator. Also, to be fair, our knowledge that this kind of, what we popularly think of as Greek stuff or even Roman stuff, uh, in terms of our Western Northern European civilization, it was discovered during the Renaissance. And those mm -hmm. people who are rediscovering it, reviewing it through a Catholic Christian lens. Mm -hmm. So you've got layer upon wow. layer of cultural assumptions wow. in terms of what were these people back in, you know, the pre-Christian era, what were they actually thinking? Well, you have to kind of work your way through several different layers of cultural presumptions in terms of translation in order mm. to even have a clue about getting back there. Mm. That's um, a great point. Mm. Which is one of the things that I personally think is so marvelous about the tradition that we're discussing here, which is that at least there is a central connection, study of Torah, study of the word, study of the letters. There's a central connection that in some regards you're dealing with not the same surface culture, obviously, um, but there's an internal connection that is the same that people, you know, that, so that there is perhaps less dis less cultural distortion mm -hmm. if you look through the lens of this. Jewish traditional material going back and back and back and back, that at least there's the central thread that's common, even though you've got wildly different cultural um, uh, surroundings, whether you're in North Africa or the Middle East or France or, you know, and what era you're in, what, what the particular cultures were dealing with, what they were eating, you know, um, what clothing they were wearing, how cold it was, how warm it was, all those things are different. But if you're dealing, but the central thread of what they revered, what they feel is important and where they go back to as a touchstone is the same thing. Right. Even, yep. even the Harryites, there's the Torah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it goes back, I mean, this is the shrine of the book in, in Jerusalem. I mean, the Isaiah scroll. Mm hmm. It's mm -hmm. thousands of years old. It's basically, it's almost exactly the same Isaiah we have now. And so what I'm saying is that in terms of, you know, how close is what we have now to an original intention, um, you know, basically that we're dealing with fewer layers of cultural, le different cultural lenses, yeah. somewhere at the beginning of it, there is a central cultural lens, which means that there, I guess one would say that our point of view on these documents, on this knowledge, can be more reliable if we pay attention because there's less cruft. Yeah, right, great, and, and what Stan emphasized was that at this geometric level, we don't have the cultural bias. And that's also true. And, yep. and that's, I think, how we are asking people to look at this work and see that what our connection is to the ancient world thinking mm -hmm. and, and everything that occurred between the Greeks and today. And obviously, the last 2000 years has all been all about cultural bias. And that's why so much of this has, has gotten lost uh, through the ages. Yes, Michael. Um, I 
before I say what I wanted to say, I just to comment on what you've been talking about. Um, there are plenty of times where one culture finds a symbol or finds a piece of knowledge and they say, this will help me explain something that I'm already talking about or that I understood in some cases, diametrically opposite from what they found. Mm -hmm. Just because this culture had it and this culture had it doesn't mean they're using it mm -hmm. in the same fashion. Right. Um, I was looking at this diagram in G um which is the one that has the conical shape the mm -hmm. as above so below right there in the middle mm -hmm. with the line down the center that says now mm -hmm. and i looked at this differently i guess because one of my teachers used to refer to a particular state of consciousness as the eternal now mm -hmm. um that that was a place that if you wanted to tap into higher wisdom, you were in the world of the eternal now. That's like the pillar, that vertical line mm. is the pillar. And then once you know, with an eternal now and an eternal oneness, if you know where it's coming from, then being able to take that oneness and subdivide it and bring it down into the world of multiplicity becomes more understandable. When you looked at the original 53 as the, aside from all the things that we talked about that it represents, uh, the initial number there says Gan, as in Gan Eden, Garden of Eden. Um, over here, I don't know if my thing works. Yeah, right over there. Okay. Um, I while I was looking at this, and then we got to the Shefa Tal, I did another gematria on the word Tal. Mm -hmm. He has all this stuff about Shefa, uh, about its different roots and so on. And then Tal, which is boxed in Hebrew and English down there, mm -hmm. uh, has a gematria as well. It's 39. And 39 is not an unimportant number. First of all, if you have to take, uh, you can go off the chart now. Um, 39, if you take Shabbat, the only ritual commandment in the Ten Commandments, um, and don't do work on Shabbat, work is divided up into 39 categories, which is an interesting choice of numbers. And those are supposedly the things that were done when they were building the tabernacle in the desert. 39, exactly, like there was not one more thing that they were doing. Taking out the garbage might have been one that wasn't in the 39. Um, and then there are children of those 39, like derivatives of those 39. But here's the thing about 39. Two of the most important words in the Shema, Hashem Echad, God is one, is 39. Hmm. And when we count the number of uh, turns in the in the fringes of the talus or the tzitzit, okay? The first, you have seven and eight and 11, that's 26, Hashem. And the next one is 13, which is Echad. Even that place from the little circle where the tzitzit are tied down to eight strands, is a representation of the same picture. Mm -hmm. But only if you're operating from that world of the eternal now. Mm -hmm. And so I don't just see it as a linear, like right now, as opposed to five years ago. Mm -hmm. To me, that's an eternal, a pillar of eternal now-ness, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And then yeah. from that is this influx of a drop of dew which is what Tal means, mm -hmm. it's, it's dew, mm -hmm. as opposed to rain, D-E-W. And that, the influx from the oneness, the Aleph at the top to the Bet world at the bottom, or the Taf world at the bottom, depending on how you want to delineate it. Um, I think the picture says even more then, because what it's saying is, okay, look, 
this once we get to the world of 53 and we get to the world of this dividing up and slanting things down we're bringing it down into this world but you have to remember that your soul is in the eternal now and that's the support pillar that is there and when you take away the the two angles you have simply the inverted t the inverted t is saying okay this is the core the core is we're in the eternal now and we're in a place of one consciousness hashem is a god is one it's like time and space except they're both oneness they're eternal they don't change now as you start to draw those lines then everything starts to move that's like the button that somebody pushed in that perfect world of tea which has never really come out as a perfect world in our <laughs> human history because whatever there might have been that in nature humankind screwed it up so if we're once that starts and the spiral comes down uh the picture that you have in d if you throw it up one more time um that spinning thing over here at the bottom mm. okay that's yeah. where it starts to spiral that's where the shefa the slant comes but what we don't see in that spiral is the vertical line that's inside of it that is keeping that perfectly symmetrical as it works its way down is that one constant so when you start talking about pi or other constants in the universe the constant here is the eternal now and the oneness that's the constant and i think all of these ancient schools got it by the way if you go eastern it depends on where you're starting from as to what's in the east okay well assuming you're starting in greece yeah, yeah. that's right it's right there yeah it's like yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's yeah, right, 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 the street, right yeah. there yeah, yeah. straight well, line. I, yeah. I heard a Columbia scholar of ancient languages and um, uh, and a lot of this stuff um, make the link between the Brahmin tradition, which is who would have held it in India eastward, and Abraham, Brahmin yeah. and Ibrahim. Yes, um, had their phonetic roots, um, and when abraham sent his children eastward with gifts the children of keturah sent them eastward with gifts that the gift was the knowledge of the oneness it was the yichud He's, and the the commentaries actually say that rashi says what was it and the marsha comes in and says it was shame tuma a an unsacred um pillar because shame also means pillar as in yad vashem um and the, the um when you're doing that that pillar when you're building that pillar um the commentary on that commentary says it's yichud believe mitzvot it's the unification the oneness of god without the mitzvot that we do in judaism okay that's what he sent with that branch of the family eastward. Interesting. Okay, Michael, I need to move on here because I want to finish sure. off the poster. Um, we have three more elements. We can do them all at one time. So let me let me put put that up here. Um, so we're looking at over on the right, uh, I, J, and K. I is this is a NASA rendering of a black hole showing the emergence, Shefa, of a twisted column from its core. The twisted column suggests the tetrahelical column, a geometric metaphor for a tree or a vine or an um umbilic. Um, so that's the black hole. This is the, uh, the J, the, the uh, unit yardstick. The twist in this model of a tree of life column is equivalent to the 99 tetrahedron tetrahedron tetrahelical column from a 310 torus knot uh that's covered in the book so if you have the book you you definitely want to uh yeah if you can understand it from the book yeah, yeah. It, well, it's tough and, that's tough and, that's and tough. yeah and if you don't understand geometry don't worry about it just think about it as eights the tree and just know that 
there's a whole lot of other stuff embedded in that. Um, it is it is very interesting to look at that uh, illustration in the book and and see what those ninety nine tetrahedrons uh, represent. Um, and then K, uh, this illustrates how the Garden of Eden triangle extends over all time, from the Big Bang to the Big Whimper, the heat depth of the universe, with a cyclicity of the Earth plane measuring off intervals of progressive time. This grid can also be inter interpreted as latitude and longitude. This is the very definition of geometry, geo equal Earth and met met metry equal measure. So he kind of brings it all around to this concept of mm -hmm. geometric metaphor. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, perhaps as, as the universe gets, you know, physically dissipates over however many billions of years or whatever, uh, the spiritual universe gets stronger. So meaning as, 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 as conscious creatures, uh, we learn, we rise, and then the physical universe has, you know, when we reach the point of whatever that's supposed to be, the physical universe that we know has no, it has no more, it doesn't have any purpose anymore. So kind of, you right. could see it, you could see this opposite. You know, so the physical universe is, is whimpering out, so to speak, but the spiritual unit, the universe within that, which is the whole purpose of the physical is, is, is getting stronger. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I never thought of that. It's very interesting. There are also are some technological uh, implications of this whole thing of, of these crossing, uh, what is it, just uh, magnetic fields and electric currents. And like, there's all sorts of neat stuff going on right now in, 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 in physics and applications of things that look very much like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. but in, in a completely in like more of a physical way. But it's just fascinating, like the connections, you know. Yeah, I mean that that's something that that we always used to discover. Um, I I have discontinued pretty much looking at the you know uh, science news announcements for for every week. But in fact, it was one of the things that uh, Stanley used to enjoy very much was relating these kinds of geometric metaphors and congruences that he found in these ancient spiritual texts with the kinds of discoveries that Stan that uh, Daniel was just talking about, um, progressions in thinking, in, uh, in physics, in biology, in, um, you know, uh, genetics, um, all kinds of different fields um, in, uh, you know, studies of consciousness and AI. Um, and so, uh, yes, it, it's almost as if, uh, you know, on a, um, on a sort of a grand scale, s similar metaphors occur at particular times in the world culture or consciousness and uh you know awareness of different kinds of relationships happen um in many different fields at once it's sort of the same idea as you know um it's long been known that inventions tend to arise in several different places at the same time you know that yeah. it, it, in a sense it's as if if there's a need for a certain particular kind of perspective, then that perspective will wind up arising in as many fields as it possibly can. Hmm. Not everybody is someone who focuses on, hey, what's congruent with this process and that process and that process in these different fields. Stanley happened to be somebody who, that was just how he thought. And so he could cross connect these different fields and in his own research, allow the discoveries in one field about these processes to enrich and inform his studies in a different field. Um, yeah. The, not many thinkers are that way, but some of them really are. So we've really gone way over our time, but I do want to, Based on what you were just saying, Lavana, I want to take this opportunity to share our dream. Uh, our dream being, our media dream being uh, to get all of this stuff digitized. The reason being, and this is a long-term project, 
um, that is going to require, you know, funding. Uh, the reason and what we would we have when we have this digitized is the ability to cross reference all these uh, ideas, so that when we click on this the unit yardstick the the tree stick spectrum it brings us to all the different references that we're we're talking about and um like i and and um you know i'm talking a lot to to our friend tad about the uses of ai to help us do that to gather information and to be able to um get the relationships between all these ideas uh, at our in our hands uh and 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 um that is going to be of extreme value beyond our co current comprehension and and finally you know give justice to stan's work in a, in the ability because again just based on what we've been talking about with michael and daniel and Bavana, you're bringing up all these different ideas and imagine the, the ability to be able to click cross-reference and bring this all into one uh into one study and it's and it's an endless task but we want to begin doing that um and we're you know we're out we're gonna well we are seeking funding uh for that uh among many other projects we have uh but that that is the keynote uh project uh getting this um uh, organized digitized and then arranged in a way that we all have access to. But for today, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you've hung in there till the end. Um, it just shows you that this one poster took up two episodes, you know, over two hours of discussion. And I'm sure we could carry this on uh, beyond, but we don't want to stretch the limit of our, you know, our, our audience. So thanks for watching. Uh, next time we'll be taking up another poster and uh we'll delve into it on the same level thank you guys so much you all are contributing so much information uh and enhancing stan's work here um so again we will push on next time thanks for watching and we'll see you next time take care